Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm just overwhelmed. You know, it's just such a wonderful deal. You know, it's always kind of sucky being the only Al-Anon speaker at an AA conference. I liken it to be a, being the corpse at an Irish wake. Uh, nobody expects you to say much, but they can't have the party without you. You know, so you're like the token dude. you got to be there. And uh, But you have such fabulous speakers this weekend, which is also very intimidating, and people that I love, and... Uh, and Gail and Sterling, Ken, and then Larry last night, you know, just a tremendous, wonderful, you know, conference lineup you have. And, um, you know, they say a good conference is like a good orgy. Uh, when it's all over, you don't remember who it was that made you feel good. So, uh, <laughs> and hopefully that's what you have going on here. So, um, and it's good to laugh. You know, it's, it's good to have fun. It's good to be with friends. You know, and all those things, none of those things was I looking for when I walked into these rooms at all. I just wanted everybody to be quiet and do what I said. And, uh, and that still thinks, sometimes I still think that's a good plan, but, uh, it's not, it's not God's plan for me, that's for sure. So, um, so I'm just gonna leap into this and, uh, tell you a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like for me now. Um, I'm the oldest of four kids. My dad was master sergeant in the army. That means I had automatic rank when I was born because I've always had younger brothers and sisters. I've always had some kind of rank, corporal, something. And, um, you know, and I, you know, raised in the military. My dad raised his family just like he did the military. Boy, we had little army bunk beds. We had, uh, we had foot lockers, army foot lockers at the end of our bunk beds. That's where we stored our gear. My dad flipped quarters on the bed. We did room inspection. You know, all that good stuff. You know, we had all that stuff because my dad stole all that stuff from the army, you know, because <laughs> when you're a master sergeant in the 50s, you don't make a lot of money, you know, and how you get supplies and stuff for your family is you steal it. You know, we ate K rations all the time. I love spam. I love little weenies in a can. I still have great affection for all that food. And uh, I remember when my husband and I got married, he's like, what is this? You know, he's a California boy. You don't know nothing. And uh, from tofu, right? And... Uh, but anyway, um, and, and that's the, you know, that's the deal that I grew up in. I also grew up in a home with an alcoholic dad, but I had absolutely no idea about that. How are you supposed to know about that when you're a little kid? You know, you're not born with a manual about what a family's supposed to look like or what a dad's supposed to do, and I certainly had no idea. My dad just drank every day. My dad got drunk every day. So, and I'm a figure-outer, you know, and I'm a figure-outer because I don't ask questions because I learned early on you don't ask questions because you'll get in trouble for asking questions. You know, so that means I just figure stuff out. I mean, I pretty much watch what's going on, and then I just use the little pieces of information I have to kind of put together the story, and I function on it. You know, I've learned to call that it's really information from nowhere because it's pretty much floating up in the universe. I think about it. It lands here, becomes fact for me, and that's what I run with. You know, and that's how I'm affected by the family disease of alcoholism. You know, and I have to remember that day in and day out, all the time, that, you know, that I'll just kind of look at a couple little pieces of thing and then just figure it all out, and what you're thinking and what I should do to make you better or whatever the deal is. And um, But anyway, I grew up with this alcoholic dad. I have no idea my dad's alcoholic, and my dad's bad alcoholic. My dad gets drunk every day. He just does. It's just what happens in our house. But again, I have no idea that this is wrong or there's anything bad about it. This is just the way I think everybody's house is. You know, my sponsor told me, you know, when I was so grateful, you know, to learn. She says, you know what, you know, what you grew up with was normal behavior in an alcoholic home. You know, and when she told me that, it really kind of took the power away from it. It just took that power out of it. And, uh, and I'm really, really grateful for that as well. Um, you know, my dad was just this master disciplinarian. He ran us like the army. I mean, he talked to us like the army. And, um, and so I grew up with all this discipline, saluting, you know, room inspections, all that good stuff. And, and I really like it. I still like it today. I like order. I like making a bed so tight you can't move. You know, I just, one of my favorite things, you know, which and I were first married. I mean, he just like lay in bed like this rigid thing, you know, like, don't you even think about moving, buddy, and uh, pulling those sheets out. And, um, and like I say, I like that. I like the order. I like having things where they go. I'm that kind of person. And, um, 
And, uh, and again, it's just what I was raised in, and it worked for me. Didn't work for my sister so much or my brother, but it definitely worked for me. And, um, and I just learned early on, do what the Sarge tells you. Do it to the best of your ability. Keep your nose clean. Stay out of trouble. Stay out of the Sarge's way. Follow orders. Duty, honor, country. I mean, those are all things, and, and, and I don't think all those things are bad things anymore. You know, I don't. But uh, anyway, I grew up with this dad, and, uh, and like I say, he's just this bad drunk, and he's a very angry drunk. He's a very violent alcoholic. And, and again, I have no idea what that's all about. You know, I often hear alcoholics talk about drinking and how they drink that first 10 or 15 minutes to get that five minutes apiece. You know, I never saw my dad even have five minutes apiece. You know, he's just a guy that was just wound up so tight, so angry, and I could never figure that was out. No matter what pieces of information I could put together, I would often wonder why a guy would get married, have kids, and then treat everybody like a piece of crap. You know, what was that about? I just never could understand or put those pieces together. But see, I have no idea my dad's alcoholic. I have no idea any of that's going on, because I think everybody's dad drinks like that. That's just the way it is. We grew up with other military family. We live in other, you know, we live in military houses, and there are lots of moms walking around with broken arms and black eyes, and nobody says anything about it. It's just what goes on. It's just what goes on. And um, and I was really fortunate when I was new in Al-Anon, uh, you know, my sponsor told me I should go to as many um, uh, meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous as I as I could because she said we should learn all we can about the disease of alcoholism, and there's no better place to learn that than in open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I remember being in one of these meetings and one of the very first speaker meetings I was ever at, and the A speaker that night talked about alcoholism, the family disease. And he described alcoholism in the home as like having a rhinoceros in your living room, but everybody pretends it's a coffee table. You know, and if I have to describe the house that I grew up in, boy, that's the house that I grew up in. Because I grew up in a time where you never talked about stuff. No. You know, everything in your house was just fine, orderly, terrific, wonderful. Nobody ever got to see what was going on. You always looked good on the outside, didn't matter what was happening on the inside. And, uh, you know, and my mom was just that way all the time. You know, it was just cover it up, don't let anybody know, don't discuss, don't talk. You know, and if you grow up in a home, you know that the first form of, uh, you know, uh, communication, the, you know, the, the first thing that really goes out the window is any kind of verbal communication whatsoever. You just quit talking about it. And you just fantasize and pretend it's going to be different and stuff is going to be different. You know, and in our house, you know, uh, my mom would get where she could tell her my dad was ready to have one of his alcoholic explosions, but she could never say to us kids, okay, don't anybody do anything. Your dad's going to blow because if she would say that, my dad would blow. And we'd be sitting at the dinner table, and boy, some minor infraction, a, a pee would roll off of a plate, you know, or somebody would spill their milk, and my dad would go to ballistic, and the dinner would get thrown across the room. Dishes would be broken. Everybody gets a beating, and you're off to bed. Five o'clock in the afternoon, it don't matter. Everybody goes to bed. My mom, the kids, the dog. It's just the rules in our house. And then the next morning, you get up the courage to, you know, walk into the kitchen, you know, because you got to go to school that morning and have breakfast. And there's my dad drinking his breakfast beer. And it's like, good morning, what do you want for breakfast? And no one ever said, gee whiz, Dad, what was that about last night? Gee whiz, how come you had to break everything? How come you had to hit everybody? You know, you just went back to the coffee, you know, pretending that, the, you know, it was a coffee table again because you hope today will be different. And that's if you have to describe alcoholism in my home, that's it, just day in and day out, you know, thinking that tomorrow will be different, hoping that tomorrow will be different. And uh, just and, and under you know and just having to rationalize and justify that behavior because I live in it you know having neighborhood kids talk about my dad I couldn't allow that couldn't have that happen as the oldest it was my job to get in fights with kids if they would say anything about my drunken dad and the exploits that he would do you know my dad was a gun toting guy and he loved to shoot things you know and 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 most of the time they weren't living but every once in a while they were you know and it was not uh, it was just wasn't fun and my dad got busted i can't tell how many times you know um you know he got busted down to rank you know thrown in the brig doing whatever and i'm the and he's the senior commission or senior non commissioned officer and i'm the senior non commissioned officer's kid you know and there's a lot of responsibility that comes along with that so that means i have to lie and cheat and do whatever to protect my dad and his reputation you know, among all the other people. And this is how I'm affected by the disease of alcoholism. I don't even know I'm doing these things. But it's just kind of like this is where I, you know, right away information, i got to step up and take this place in our home and what's going on. And anyway, you know, it just gets progressively worse as it does. And, uh, you know, my dad ended up, he ended up dying. He was 55 years old when he died. He died the death that they talk about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, Total Insanity and Death. 
I can't even tell you the last words my father said to me. They were so violent, so vulgar, I wouldn't even begin to repeat them from this podium. And I always say the last words my father said to me, when in reality what I know is really the last words my father's alcoholism said to me. Because when my dad died, believe you me, looking at him in that room, in that bed, there was no person left anymore. There was just, just the ugly disease of alcoholism lying there. Just totally chewed the man up. Chewed him up. And, uh, and when he died, you know, my mom had since divorced him, and uh, I was the oldest, so I had the power of attorney for his medical, and all of that responsibility was on me. And I remember my sisters and I going out in the hallway, and the doctors coming out saying, you know, your dad has died, and I'd like to tell you we were sad. We were not. My sisters and I were like, ding dong, the witch is dead, da, da, da. You know, and I don't tell you the story because I'm proud of it. I tell you the story because this is where the disease of alcoholism will take you, that you will be glad to have a family member dead, you know, just so that it can be over. You know, it's the only way you can know that it can be over. And again, and that's the lie of the family disease of alcoholism as well, because boy, you know, you know what happened was the alcoholic died, but the, but the family disease of uh, alcoholism was alive and well in me and my sisters. Totally untouched in us, because we were just, you know, maybe you need an alcoholic to start it off, but we were, you know, we were well entrenched in it. And I found this out the very difficult way because I really did believe that when my dad had died that that nastiness and that horribleness would have gone away. And it didn't. It didn't at all. And I was in Al-Anon a short amount of time. I had started coming to Al-Anon in, uh, oh, and I know you guys are on the, on the date, you know. Uh, I started coming to Al-Anon June the 6th of 1981. And my dad died October the 13th, Friday the 13th of 1981 because my dad would pick Friday the 13th because that was just his kind of day. And... Uh, and uh, and so so j June to October, you know, only been coming to Al-Anon a few months, not at all loving and kind, none of that stuff was going on at all. I was just, you know, starting to feel my way in. And and so, uh, uh, and when my dad had passed away, you know, and I was working the steps, working with the sponsor, doing everything that was asked of me. And it wasn't too long, you know, four or five, six months after my dad has died, and I am just as angry and just mad as I've ever been in my life. You know, and I was doing the work and doing the step work, and I couldn't understand it. You know, I couldn't understand it. And I remember talking to my sponsor about it, and she assured me that I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing here. But she also told me that Al-Anon isn't about the problem. Al-Anon is about solutions. And you have to look at a solution for you. And I'm going to give you an assignment, and you're not going to like it. And she always says, and you're not going to like it, because I have never, ever liked any little weeny thing they have ever asked me to do in Al-Anon. <laughs> Because I know it's a simple program, but really that simple, I have huge problems. You know, surely things that are this simple cannot help someone with the complicated problems that are going on in my life. You know, let go and let God. You know, I think let go and let God what? You know, I mean, I need that other information. You know, I don't, you know, I'm just like, you just can't leave it out there and never, never land. And uh, so... Uh, because I think there has to be some other thing, you know, and, and, and so we miss the simplicity of the program because it complicates the stuff out of it, you know, and that's the beauty of it. You bring in all this horrendous stuff and you just lay it at the feet of the program and the simplicity of it alone will let you see the ridiculousness of what you give so much power to, what you give or what I gave so much power to. And anyway, she gave me the assignment. She said, I want you to go home and I want you to think about a good thing your dad did for you. And again, how I've been affected by the family disease of alcoholism is in a very negative way, because I never see good in nothing. You know, it's always, there's no, there's no sunshine, there's no nothing, it's just, it's horrible. And if it's not horrible yet, it's going to get horrible real quick, real soon. Don't worry, just wait, it's coming. And, uh, and when you're living like that all the time, you can't enjoy anything that's good. And so my initial reaction is that there's no such thing. My dad was a hateful, spiteful man. He hated having girl children. He made us feel really bad about being girls. You know, and you want me to think up some really good thing my dad did to me when all I can ever remember from that man is nothing but fear. My first emotion is fear. The very first thing I remember in my whole life was being afraid of my dad. And you want me to think up a good thing. She goes, no, I just want you to go home and be willing to think up a good thing. You know, and one thing I'm so grateful for that I learned, I believe, is really is God's grace for me is that I've always been willing since I've been in Al-Anon. You know, when I heard at one of those very first meetings, you know, that if you're not willing to do anything different, how can you possibly expect anything to be different? And for whatever reason I heard that, and I've always been willing, it's only this much. You know, that's all I'm willing to do is this much. But again, this program is so powerful. You know, you only need this much willingness, but you need some. So I was that much willing. And I don't know how long it was, a week or two weeks. 
and I remembered that my dad taught me how to drive. And if you're going to live in Southern California and marry an alcoholic and chase that sucker down, that's a skill you just got to have, you know. I mean, it just is. Because those alcoholics are movers, man. They don't stay in one place. They're all over the place. you got to be able to get in a car and go after their butts. And, uh, and, and I'm talking about tracking down alcoholics. And Benoit and Ella know what I'm talking about. No GPS, no cell phones. You just put your butt in the car and you just go find them. You know, that was the hard way to do it. And, uh, and boy, I was successful a lot of the time. But, um, um, but, you know, he taught me how to drive. And I didn't think my sponsor would be happy with the answer. I really didn't think that she would, and um, but I sincerely hope that everybody in this room is sponsored as I have been sponsored, and I've had two sponsors. My first sponsor, Jeannie, that I had for the first nine years I was in Al-Anon until she died of liver cancer, and then my sponsor, Carol, that I've had all the rest of this time, and uh, and they have just been, you know, the most loving, wonderful people. You know, they are, having a sponsor is like having your own personal rooting section. Why you wouldn't want one, I can't even begin to imagine. They want you to do really well here, you know, and for a lot of reasons. And one is that, you know, they look good when you do good, you know. So, I mean, and so that's a win-win situation. I don't know how they look good, you look good, everybody's happy. But, oh, no, we, I got to fight that tooth and nail every chance I get. And I didn't think that Jeannie would be happy with my answer. But, you know, my first sponsor, Jeannie, she's this little Dutch lady, you know, very short. Um, yeah, uh, and she's a clapper, which does, I despise, you know, when a... Every time, you know, like you're in kindergarten or something, you know, it's just like I would either get the clapping or the. When I, when I was letting her down there, I guess. And, uh, and so I went to her and I said, you know, I thought of a good thing my, did, my dad did. Oh, okay, okay. You know, and I said he taught me how to drive. And I thought now I'm going to get them, you know. But no, instead she was leaping for joy. Wonderful. That is fantastic. You know, because what I didn't know, because I was a rookie newcomer, you know, was that when your sponsor gives you an assignment, there will be part two. I just wasn't, hooked, you know, happy to that yet. I didn't know about that yet. So, uh, and now part two of my assignment is whenever I thought about how my dad made me feel, how he hit me, you know, how he uh, made me feel bad about being a girl, the things he just did to make me feel bad about being on the planet, that I was just to take that negative thought and just replace it with this positive one. You know, and it wasn't too long after that that I came up with the second thing my dad had done and a third thing that my dad had done. Because, again, the family disease of alcoholism doesn't want you to see or see any good or anything in anybody. Just wants you to live in the despair, wants you to live in the sadness, wants you to live in the anger and the resentment because that's how it keeps feeding on itself over and over and over again. And even though my dad is gone, I'm still carrying on that hatred and that anger when I do that behavior. And I don't mean to tell you I was raised by this hellacious man, you know, who drank and hit us. And then uh, my sponsor gave me this little weenie assignment, and now it's all freaking rainbows and butterflies up the gazoo here. You know, that is not what happened for me at all. What, what happened is my sponsor gave me such a precious gift. She gave me the gift of forgiveness. You know, and it says in our al -Anon literature, forgiveness is no favor. We do it for nobody but ourselves. You see, and I thought that if I forgave my dad, I was letting him off the hook. And I wasn't going to let him off the hook because it's not right. And I'm not saying you come to al -Anon and you learn that that's right. There's nothing right about it. He was the dad. I was the girl. I'm supposed to be his little princess. I'm supposed to be, you know, the person he's taking care of that makes me feel special. And none of that was going on at my house. And that's never not going to be right. But that's how our family was affected by the disease of alcoholism. You know, my sponsor went on to tell me, you know, your father died with all of his children being grateful he was dead. Do you really need to punish anybody more than that? You're a mom. Is that what you want? You want your kids when you die to be happy and jumping up and down for joy when you die? You think you need to punish anybody more than that? You know, what I know is that my dad suffered from the disease of alcoholism. You know, and it chewed him up, and it ate him up, and it killed him, and it, and it left him with his family being glad for it, and I don't need to punish anybody more than that. It's not necessary in my life anymore, and I am so grateful for that. I know that he loved me, and he loved my sisters, you know, as much as his alcoholism would allow him to do that. And it's a progressive disease, so it got progressively worse. And I am just really grateful to know that. You know, when my dad died, my dad was also a, a Korean War veteran, a World War II veteran. My dad served with distinction, and um, he was in the Navy first, and then, uh, and then career in the Army. And um, he had a lot of medals, he had the Purple Heart. Um, and he was in battle, and he saved other people's lives in battle. And... Um, my dad was very proud of his military career, and um, 
And so when he died, they brought me his ashes, the flag, his medals. I happened to be home alone that day. And um, so they, they, you know, they do all their pomp and circumstance. They give me all the stuff. And so I took my dad's ashes and I went down to the, down to our, uh, in our garages, our washer dryer. And I put them in the laundry room and I sat them behind the dryer. And I said, you sit here and you think about what you did. <laughs> and, uh, and my dad sat there for a long time. I'm talking a long time. I'd go down there every so often. Hey, Sarge, who's in charge now? Sarge, you know. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Sarge. I'm doing the talking now, you know, and whatever. And every so often, I just pick up that box and shake the crap out of it and set it back down, you know. <laughs> all sponsor approved. All sponsor approved. Because it's a process, you know. And I mean, so I ended up having to walk through that deal. But anyway, um, you know, when I was a teenager, my dad got out of the Army, and, and we moved to Southern California. And up until this point, I'd always lived in Europe or on the East Coast. We moved every two years because that's just what you do in the Army. And, um, and so I was very regimented. Lots of rules, lots of regulations. We always lived in military housings. We always lived with other military families. Very disciplined. And then we moved to California in the 60s. Nothing going on there, boy. That was like moving to another planet. And so, and us girls are getting old enough to date. So, uh, um, you know, my dad has a lot of rules and regulations about dating. And we have to bring these weenie guys home to our house. And my dad is over six foot tall. He has one eyebrow. He can raise like six inches above his forehead. So he looks like Satan himself standing there. You know, my dad's a tall guy, too. And, he, and he's an ex master sergeant. He's got that master sergeant voice. But as you know, you get used to it. You know, again, uh, it was no big deal for me, but apparently it freaked out these guys, you know, because my they'd come get us and then my dad would, where are you going? When are you going to be back? And then he'd tell them what part of their anatomy he would remove if we were not returned in the virginal condition of which we left the house in the first place. So really hard to get a second date in my house. And, uh, and the fact that my dad always had a gun or a uh, hand grenade never helped either, you know, I mean... But again, I grew up with that. I grew up with that. So it's just, again, it becomes normal behavior. I didn't think anything about it, ever anything. My dad was always going to blow up the mailman or the Helms Bakery guy or the neighbors. It's just the stuff that always went on in our house. And this is how I have no issues with how we become sick, too. Because I have to rationalize and justify this behavior all the time. And I say, you know, living with alcoholism is kind of having like a bowl of crap in front of you. And I don't think anybody here would sit there and eat a whole bowl of crap. But I am here to tell you, you'll choke down a teaspoon every day if it'll make peace in the house, if it'll just make it quiet for the day. And then you wonder how you get affected by the disease of alcoholism. And it's just that teaspoon every single day that does it. That does it. That takes a family to cause them to hate each other and want to hurt each other. That's the family disease of alcoholism. So anyway, when I was 17, I met my husband. I knew there was something wrong with him because my dad liked him, like, right away. And that never, ever happened. And, um, and I mean, we went on this date, and, uh, and my husband is seven years older than I am. So he'd been married once before, had a kid, was back loving, living with his mom and dad, which should have been clue number two to me that there was something wrong with them. And uh, we went on this, like, I met him, like, on this blind date thing, and, uh, and we were with this other couple, and... And, and now we're going to go back to his house, and he stops at a liquor store, and he asks me what I would like to drink. Well, I am 17 years old, and there are rules and regulations in the state of California. You know, and I proceed to tell him what the laws are in the state of California, and that I am an underage minor, buddy. It is against the law for me to drink alcoholic beverages. And I know he heard then what he still hears today when he doesn't want to hear what I'm saying. He heard blah, 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 blah. <laughs> You know, because he went in and got a gallon of Red Mountain wine, if nothing to impress me with his wine knowledge, I suppose. I have no idea. I don't know nothing of it. And so we go back, and we go back to his house. We're going to play this game. It's called Pass Out. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but it's a legitimate board game. You can still get it, like, on eBay. It has rules. I read them all. And, uh, and so now we're going to play this game. And I don't drink because it's against the law to drink. Because, I, you know, I am regimented, boy. I've got rules and regulations for everything that goes on. I have, like, an index card for every conceivable thing that can happen on the face of the planet. Because I'm a list checker offer. You know, this is what you do. You do one, you do two, you do three. You know, and for me, I know it just brings order to my life. I need to have things that way so I can just function through whatever it is that's going on. You know, one of the things I'm the most grateful for in Al-Anon is that, you know, that works for me, but it doesn't mean it works for everybody. You know, and I accept the fact that that's what I need for me, but just because it works for me, it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be, you know, what you want to be doing. But I am that kind of a person. And, you know, so there's a lot of rules about everything that goes on. And, uh, you know, and so, and while I don't drink, you know, we're going to play this drinking game. 
you know, and when you have as many rules as I do, sometimes you have to shift them around. And if you're hanging out with alcoholics, you will be shifting your rules a lot, trust me. And, uh, you know, so I don't drink, but, you know, I have another rule that I must win every game I play, you know, and if you're going to play a drinking game, then obviously you got to drink something to win it. And I probably drank a half a glass of that god-awful wine, and I won the game. That's what that was all about. And guess who was drinking the rest of the wine? You know, and guess who's just so drunk and just having a gay old time? And I'll tell you what I remember about that day more than anything still to this day is how much fun I had. Oh, my gosh. So much fun. I just was laughing, just having a wonderful time. I'd never had that much fun ever in my life. It just wasn't allowed. It just wasn't allowed. And uh, and believe you me, I've got an index card about what my life is going to be. You know, and first on that card is, I'm going to get married. I'm going to marry this guy that just only wants to have girl children. We're going to have like seven girls, and he's going to love me and love our girls. And, you know, and he's not going to drink. Believe you me, that's on the card. Because I'm 17, I know drinking is the deal in my house. I know that that's, that's the problem. You can cut the hate in my house with a knife between my mom and dad. That is not going to happen to me. This is going to be so different. You know, yet I'm going out with Butch. I'm having this wonderful time. I really want to go out with him again. But, you know, he's drinking, and that's one of the things on my card that's not allowed. But I'm here to tell you, as an Al-Anon, I will rationalize and justify my behavior, stand toe-to-toe with any alcoholic in this room, without a doubt. And again, information from nowhere lands here becomes fact for me. Because what I think about is, see, when my dad drinks, he wants to hit you and yell, yell at you, you know, and tell you what a bad person you are. When Butch drinks, he just wants to kiss you and hug you and tell you how pretty you are. I don't know about you guys, but I can work with that, okay? That's just got that potential in alcoholics that we love so much. And, um, and, so, and so pretty much from that on, you know, we started dating exclusively. It was really hard for me to date Butch, basically because he couldn't remember my name. But uh, you can't let a little thing like that stop you from going out with an alcoholic, now can you? you got to hang in there tough. You know, I know, you know, he, I know, know my name is difficult. You know, he called me Lorraine, Lucerne, Lori. He called me all kinds of stuff. He knows my name now pretty well, but, uh, um, but back then he had a hard time with it. I know my name is different, and I like to tell this story because this is, this is my dad's story. And uh, my dad named me Larsine because I was first born. Very, very upset that I was not a boy. Very upset that my second sister wasn't a boy. Just suicidal when my third sister wasn't a boy. I am not kidding. My dad was gone for like a month when my third sister was born. And he took it out on all of us. Pissed. And, um, but anyway, because I was first born, and, and I was his firstborn. He named me Larsine, which he told me was the name of a town in Scotland. Because my dad was hugely proud of his Scottish heritage. And though he made it very clear to me that he was very disappointed that I was not a girl that he gave me this special, this special name because I was his firstborn, and I should always be extremely proud of it. And I always have been. I've been taught that since I, I don't remember not knowing that. And uh, so anyway, after my dad is dead, I'm in the program doing the deal here. I get curious about Larsine Scotland, so I go, you know, this is before computers at home and Google and stuff. I went to a building with information. They called them libraries back in the day. Yes, where you went. And I go to the library to look up Larsine Scotland. I can't find it. So I go to the reference librarian because we just have a little weenie library by us. And she goes, I give her the information. She goes, we'll check it out. Come back in two weeks. I come back in two weeks. No Larsine Scotland. Place doesn't exist. There is no Larsine Scotland. Well, I've been coming to Al-Anon a while, and I've been through this whole forgiveness thing with my dad. And here he is stabbing me from the grave, the butthood that he is. And, uh, you know, now I'm going to change my name, bite me. You know, I am just angry. And... Uh, but we have this friend, and he goes to Scotland every year because he's a big golfer, and I guess it's like the Golf of Mecca or something there. And he says, you know, maybe there's not Larsine Scotland now. Maybe there was Larsine Scotland like thousands of years ago. It's an old country. Let me talk to my friends in Scotland before you go whack a So uh, <laughs> off he goes to Scotland. He comes back two weeks later. Nobody's ever heard of Larsine Scotland. So now I'm done. I am going to change my name. I am pissed, and everybody that knows me knows how angry I am about it. And then I happened to be with my husband at his, at his AA meeting one night, and, uh, and this friend of ours in AA walks up to me, and he goes, Larsine, I found out that Larsine is a Scottish word. I'm like, oh my God, you're kidding me. What does it mean? He goes, it is Scottish, for father was drunk when daughter was born, so daughter got a weird name. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> now, I am pretty sure that that is not true, Okay. But what he went on to say to me is, you know, Larsine, I am, I am alcoholic like your dad is alcoholic. And he goes, and I don't know what he read, and I don't know how he read it. I don't know what he was even looking at. 
He goes, but I believed that he believed that when he named you Larsen, it was the name of a town in Scotland. And just because the gift isn't wrapped the way that you think it's supposed to be wrapped doesn't make it any less of a gift. You know, and one more time, you know, I'm here to tell you, my circumstances don't change here. But you guys show me a different way to look at things, my attitude changes, and then I get the shot at a good life. And that's pretty much what gets to happen to me over and over and over again here because I am doomed to look at it from the worst part. This is how I am. I am hardwired this way growing up in the disease of alcoholism. But I show you and tell you what's going on. You show me a different way to look at it, you know, and I get the shot at a good life. You know, and uh, and my husband, uh, I got another car, and, and I have license plates that say Larsine because there's seven letters, and so he got, we have license plates, California Larsine. So he got me license plate holders that say it's the name of a town in Scotland. And, uh, <laughs> and you'd be surprised all the people that are saying to me, is that really, I've never been there. Where is it? You know, it's just whatever. It's, it's, it's out there somewhere, trust me. So... Uh, but anyway, Butch and I were dating, and what ended up happening is that I got pregnant. I was 19 years old, and um, and I don't care if it's a huge deal for you. It was a huge deal for me it's back in 1974. And um, and later on, when I got life really got bad behind the drinking and using and all that stuff, I was, was sure it was because God was punishing me. You know, that was um, the big rule breaker, you know, and that was the big punishment from above. You know, I had to be in Al-Anon a while to find out that if you're going to screw around and not use any birth control, you might get pregnant just a fact of life. But if you're sitting in this room and you're blaming God because you think there's a punishing God out to get you, then I don't even know what defense you would have against anything like that. You know, the God that I've been exposed to is nothing but a loving and kind God. You know, and everybody, what, you know, what's God's plan for me? What's God's plans for me? You know, I believe God's plan for us is to be happy, joyous, and free. I think it says that in the big book. We know that God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. So then my question is, what do I do to honor God's will for me? What do I do to make sure that I'm happy, joyous, and free? You know, and that's what I get from sponsorship. You know, that they always point that out to me. No matter what's going on in your life, there's some happy and joy and free in there somewhere if you're willing to look for it. You know, because God knows I can find the drama in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. And anyway, Butch and I got married um, a month after our son was born. So if you ask me if I was um, married or if I was pregnant when I got married, no, I wasn't. Because I wasn't. (laughs) You know, maybe I had a one-month-old baby there, but that's for you to figure out. I can't help it if you don't know stuff. And, um, but I'm, and up until that point, I'd never talked with Butch about his drinking or his drug use, nothing. But the day after we got married, the day after we got married, I sat him in the kitchen chair and I told him the rules and regulations of the marriage. You know, we get a babysitter once a month. That's it. Other than that, you're working. You're bringing me home the check. You're behaving. We're being good. I got a plan. You're on board. And he sat in the chair and did this, which I took as affirmative. You know, when I know today he was so drunk and loaded, he was just doing this good thing, you know, and stuff like that. And I know that because day three of our marriage, he does not come home all night long. This is a huge violation of the rules and regulations I have sat down. And I am proud to tell you, my husband begged for the silent treatment. He never got it, not one time. I am like one of those little dogs, you know, when you walk in the room, just yap, 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 and curse. I don't even know where I learned this language from. You know, and again, information from nowhere lands here, because I'm sure if I curse with the right mothers and effers in the right order, that he's going to have some spiritual awakening and, you know, (laughs) stop doing that stuff. And again, all the insanity that's just there right from the beginning, right from the beginning. You know, and I want you to positively know that the driving force behind Butch and I getting married was the fact that we had this child. There is no doubt about it. But I want you to know that we got married in a church. We got married in front of a minister, that he loved me, and I believed, uh, you know, and I know that I loved him, you know, and that I believe he was sober that day. And we were as sincere as any two people are getting married. We really wanted to love each other and take care of each other, do all those vows things that you, that you talk about. We wanted to do every one of those things. Definitely did I want my life to be different. Oh, my God, did I want my life to be different. You know, but I'm here to tell you, Butch and Larsine got married that day, but what I didn't know was that it was also the disease of alcoholism that got married that day, too. And I'm here to tell you the family disease of alcoholism doesn't love or cherish anything or anybody, and it'll tear your family apart through the alcoholic or through the non-alcoholic. It's so irrelevant to the family disease of alcoholism. You know, and that's just where, you know, that's just where it took off. It just took off. Because I don't understand alcoholism. I don't, I don't know that. You know why? Because I can drink or not drink. Information from nowhere lands here becomes fact for me. And if I can drink or not drink, that means you can drink or not drink, so therefore you're drinking at me. You're hurting me, and now I'm going to hurt you. 
you know, because that's what I brought to it. That's all I know. I don't know anything different because I don't understand. I don't understand why you tell me you're not going to do it anymore and then you do. That means you don't love me. That means you're trying to hurt me over and over and over again because I don't understand that part of it. I have no idea that once he takes a drink, there's no more promises, there's no more wife, there's no more kids, there's no more nothing. There's just where that drink is going to take him until he's done doing it. And I have no idea about that, you know, and just the insanity that goes over and over and over again. And uh, and just one quick story about that. Um, um, my husband's friends who were the drug dealer and awful people that I affectionately refer to as the scum of the earth people, um, they, you know, they call me and they tell me that uh, my husband is so drunk and so loaded at their house that if I don't come get him, they, the drug dealers, are going to call the police. <laughs> this is what I have in my life. And... Uh, and I remember putting on my cape and going off to get him. And, uh, and I had, you know, our, our son with us. He's, still, he's, he's a baby at this point still. And I remember getting there and the drug dealers looking through the blinds, you know, because he was in the drug dealer's bushes out in the front there. And uh, I got him in the car and I drive us home and I take our son to go put him upstairs in his crib, come down to get Butch. And Butch has made the mistake of getting out of the car without my help. He's fallen in the street, cut his head open, blood gushing out. Like to tell you I'm concerned about him. I am not. I just don't want anybody to see him. Another mess. And so he's 180 pounds of wet washcloth. There's no picking the guy up. So I got him by the ankles, heave him up over the curb, dragging him down the sidewalk, little trickle of blood coming out of his head, leaving a trail there. Why we call these people normies, I have not a clue, okay? But here I am dragging a guy, bleeding by the head down the sidewalk. Here comes this guy driving down the street, he stops his car. Are you having a problem? Because that's what the normie people think. It's just a problem. And I guess my husband's falling and he can't get up. And... Uh, <laughs> So the guy helps me get him up, and for whatever reason, I'm taking him in the house, and again, I don't have an index card for this, never had a bloody-headed husband before, had to make up a card, right away I got to have him in bed, because you got a head injury, that's where you go, it goes on the card, got to check it off. So our, our bedroom is up a flight of stairs, it's on the second floor, so not only do I have to get him in the house, I have to get him up a flight of stairs. And now the words are flying between him and I, and Mr. Good Samaritan no longer wishes to participate in this group activity. <laughs> So that guy was out the door like a flash, and now Butch is on the bed, big puddle of blood. You know, now I want him to die desperately, because this is my plan. You know, I just really do want him to die. You know, someone once said, why didn't you just divorce him and let him win? Oh, I don't think so. That's not going to happen. No, 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 no. He's going out feet first. That's the plan. I'm a widow. Doesn't it just make you feel sorry for me? I love that plan. And, uh, you know, so, um, but, uh, you know, now he's bleeding, but I don't want my fingerprints anywhere on it, you know, so I, I'm hysterical. I call 911. They don't know what the heck's going. They sent a hook and ladder truck, the police, the paramedics, they even got a hold of my mother. It's craziness. And, uh, and so I'm in the bedroom with the baby. Oh, my husband, my husband. And the Redondo Beach police come in and they go, Mrs. Gantner, your husband says he injured himself because you pushed him down a flight of stairs. <laughs> and, um, and of course I hadn't done that, but I told the police, We'll prop him up there, and I'll be happy to push him down in front of the Redondo Beach police because that's just what we need, more drama. We need more drama, you know, and that's, again, how I'm affected by the disease of alcoholism is I just feed into it, and I'm not the alcoholic, and I feed right into it. And, uh, and so anyway, they clean him all up, and he's got a little weenie cut, but he's too drunk to walk, and he does need stitches in his head. So, you know, they have to bring an ambulance in to take him out, you know. And Butch is really friendly, always has been. Well, he knows all the neighbors. I'm huge on anonymity. I speak to no one. And, you know, so here comes Butch out on the gurney. Hi, you Frank. Hi, you Joe. You know, all the neighbors are out there. What happened, Butch? Larsine pushed me down a flight of stairs. <laughs> and every single one of those people believe him. Every single one does. Because all they see is drunk, easy-going Butch and screaming, yelling, Banshee Larsine, you know. And half my neighbors would tell me, if I was married to you too, woman, I'd be drinking, you know. I mean, you are hard on that man, hard on that man. You know, but again, they don't love an alcoholic and they don't know anything about what's going on. They don't know anything what's going on. And I'm living the lie because I'm acting like this is what I grew up with. You just act like everything's fine. I go to work. Tell a little bit about what happened over the weekend and watch people get that glazed overlook. Why are you putting up with that? Why would you stay with that? They don't love an alcoholic. They don't know anything about any of that. So you learn to lie about it. And that's what the family disease of alcoholism wants you to do. Lie, isolate, because that's what you have to do. You tell so many lies, you have to stay away. Just too crazy. You can't go to any family functions anymore because you can't guarantee what's going to happen or not happen. 
And in all that insanity, you know, I ended up going to an Al-Anon meeting, and, uh, and it was a great meeting, great literature on the table, but not the piece of literature I want, which is how to get them to stop drinking and do what you want them to do. I still love that title to this day. And... Uh, but, uh, you know, but yet when I was sitting in that front row, if they said, Larsine, do you want your life to be different? Oh, my God, do I want my life to be different? Larsine, what are you willing to do about it? Nothing, because it's not my fault. You fix him, not my fault. And again, one more time, my inability to take responsibility for the choices that were standing in front of me. So easy to blame someone else. So easy to be the victim. So easy I fell into that trap and didn't even see it happening. Didn't even see it happening. Didn't even care about my own kids and how it was affecting them. Though I would have told you that I did. When in reality, they never needed protection from their dad as much as they needed protection from their mother. I was insane. Absolutely nuts insane. And, uh, and not anything that I'm proud about at all. And there was this one particular incident, and it was which is one of nine kids. And uh, they were having his big family reunion. And I made him raise his right hand and promised me he would be sober that day so we could go and look good. And that day come, and guess who's so drunk and so loaded they can't even stand up? And I'm so angry. And I'm here to tell you, my husband's a blackout drinker, and no matter how blacked out, drugged out, drunk he's been, he has never, ever raised a hand to hit me. He just never has. But that day I was poking him in the chest, and I was egging him to hit me. Let's just take it to the next level. Let's just take it to the next level, because i got to add more drama to it. And all of a sudden I became very conscious. By this point we had two little boys. They're like five and three years old, and they're standing on either side of me, and they're yanking at my pant legs. Big tears running down their face. Mommy, mommy, please stop yelling at daddy. You know, and I like to tell you that I had a moment of clarity then, but I did not. What I started doing was I started screaming at those little babies. How dare they tell me to stop yelling at their dad when he's the reason our life is the piece of crap? And by the time I got done screaming at these little kids, I watched my drunken husband walk out the front door. And I, the sober mom, say to the drunken dad, where do you think you're going? And the drunken dad turns to the sober mom and says, I'm leaving because we're upsetting the kids. And again, I don't tell you the story because I'm proud of it. I tell you the story because this is where the family disease of alcoholism took me. And I think I'm the good guy in the scenario. I'm the one with the job. I'm the one holding the family together. I'm the one keeping a roof. You know, when you're living that lie, can't even see my own behavior anymore. I love in our literature where it says how we become er uh, nervous and irritable without knowing it. And why? Because we try and force solutions. My solutions. Not even what they need. My solutions. Because it's never been about really him. It's about how it always affects me. Though I will tell you it's about them. You know, and just the craziness that goes over and over and over again. You know, what ended up happening is a, is a, is a little bit after that. My husband ended up getting arrested for drunk driving. Absolutely no big deal. He's been arrested lots of times for drunk driving. On a scale of 1 to 10, I wouldn't give his last drunk a, a 5. But that's the one that got him sober. You know, and and uh, and he ended up getting sober, and he was sober for a couple of years, going to AA, doing the deal, and um, and uh, you know, and when he first got sober, he went in a hospital program. He got sober in 1979, but they didn't do no family thing. They said I used to go to AA Al-Anon meetings. Sign, okay, I'll follow the rules and go to AA Al-Anon meetings. So I went back to that meeting I was already at that first time when I'd been there about two years ago. And I walked back in, and I said, you know, I was here two years ago, and I asked you how to get my husband sober, and you didn't tell me, and I'm not going to tell you how I got him sober now. Because <laughs> I really believed it. You know, and you know what they said to me? Keep coming back. And I want you to know that if you're ever at a meeting, AA or Al-Anon, and they tell you to keep coming back, it's because you've said the most asinine BS crap in the universe. That's your only hope. Your only hope is that you keep coming back to get your head out of your butt and you can actually maybe get some recovery going on here. And, uh, but, um, so of course I didn't go back, you know, and, um, and, uh, and, you know, my husband just kept going to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and he kept, and, and I'm so, so grateful that he went to a group that told him to take his program home, you know, because that's what he did. He just brought his program home with him every single day, despite my anger despite my yelling and screaming at him, despite any of it. He just stayed a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, was a good husband, was a good father, was a good provider. All the things I thought would fix me. And I was just as angry as I'd ever been in my life. And, um, you know, to make a long story short, because i got to wrap this up real quick here, you know, um, uh, two years into his sobriety, I started coming to Al-Anon. I didn't come to Al-Anon to get him sober, keep him sober. He was doing fine on his own. I came because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I got my first precious sponsor, Jeannie, you know, and again, I can't say enough about having a sponsor right out of the gate, and, uh, you know, everything she told me to do, I was all over it because I'm a rule follower. 
And, um, you know, and she's just, uh, you know, I can't even begin to tell you all the things that woman did for me those first nine years, you know, that gave me the opportunity to have a shot at a good life. You know, and, and you know, and, and in the 33, you know, plus years that I've been in Al-Anon, you know, just so you know, it's not some easy roller coaster thing or I've just been this smooth sailing thing. There's a couple of stories my sponsor, Carol, now wants me to tell you all the time because she wants you to know how difficult I am to sponsor, uh, even at this point in my life. And the first is my son, Earl, and... Um, uh, and, and I had a lot of problems with this kid, a lot of drugs and alcohol, you know, as an early teenager. And, uh, you know, and I was done, boy. I think there ought to be a limit about how many alcoholics you can have in your life. I mean, you know, I, there ought to be a three-rule limit at least, you know. I mean, anything more than that is just over the top. But, uh, um, but anyway, but not my kids. Oh, my God, not my kids. I remember when they were little and I found out alcoholism might be hereditary. Butch is sober. They're like three and five years old. They make them both raise their right hand and promise me that they will not be alcoholic. And they do because they got a lunatic mother. And uh, yes, whatever she says, just say yes. And uh, so anyway, a lot of problems with Earl. I'm about, uh, you know, I think I'm about 11 years in Al-Anon and, and, um, and Earl is 19 and... Um, uh, and a lot of problems with drugs and alcohol. I am terrified for this kid. We happen to be at our South Bay Roundup, and I come home, and uh, and we've been at this Roundup for three days. Wonderful speakers, you know, wonderful workshops. And you know, you come home from that, and like serenity's coming out of every orifice of your body, you know. And I was all full of the joy and the love and all that. But I'm very disciplined in my exercise program. I have an exercise for three days now. I got to do three days worth of exercise in one, because I got to check it off the list. And uh, so. Uh, I had a treadmill, and I go out to the garage in the treadmill, and next to my treadmill is my son's weight bench. And on this weight bench is a driver's license. It's a woman's driver's license. It has information. I love information. This woman's in Glendora, California. Her birth date's on there. She's 32 years old. I automatically, in 10 seconds, again, information from nowhere, Lance here becomes fact for me. I decided she was in my house. She had sex with my 19-year-old son. She has two kids, wants to marry him and call me mom. I am all over this story. And... uh and so I run into the house, and I show Butch the driver's license, but nothing, because the man has no imagination whatsoever. <laughs> driver's license. So I tell him what I think happened over the weekend. His eyes roll back in his head, you know, and uh, crazy loony tick, you know. He says, call Carol. Carol, you know, is my sponsor and stuff like that. You're a whack job. I call Carol. Carol agrees with Butch. I'm a whack job. And uh, she rarely gives me direction, but that day she told me to shut up. She goes, shut up. She goes, I know what you're, you know, what's the worst that can happen? That kid can die. And it happens. It's happened to so many people, so many people. And I'm here to tell you, I have been with so many women who have lost children, lost their husbands, tell you there's no black belt down on when that stuff's going on. They feel every bit of it. The program just lets them walk through that process, not alone, not alone. And, um, and I'm so grateful for that. But she goes, you know, Larsine, there's enough crap going on in that kid's life without you making up more crap to add to the plate out of that sick head of yours. You know, it takes just as much effort to think good thoughts for him as it does negative ones. So why don't you just pray for him instead? And I end my conversation, as I often do with my sponsor, never mind. You know, because I've been coming. I just need to be reminded. And as it turns out, I don't see my son for a couple of days, his work drug schedule, school schedule, my work schedule. And he walks in the kitchen two days later with the driver's license. He says, Mom, what do you do when you find a driver's license? Well, I don't tell him what I do when I find a driver's license because that is one bad example Somebody who's going to meetings, working the steps, doing the deal here. You know, but that was the way that it went. You know, and that kid went on a roller coaster ride, boy. We had to ask him to leave our home because we had a sober home. You know, and, and, but, you know, the thing I am the most grateful of, and I will always be eternally grateful, is that you guys taught me unconditional love because I love that kid. There's nothing he's ever going to do that makes me not love him. And you reminded me about that over and over and over again. But unacceptable behavior is unacceptable behavior. I have the right to make rules in our home. And I have the right to enforce those rules. But it doesn't mean I don't love you. It means this is just the way that it has to be. You know, and that kid went on a ride for as long as he had to go on a ride for. And, uh, and about uh, a year and a half ago, he came to his dad. And he said he had a problem. And, um, and his dad gave him over to some of his uh, some people that he knew in Alcoholics Anonymous and gave him a big book. And, and he's got about... Uh, a year and nine months of sobriety right now, and I can't tell you how grateful I am. I can't tell you what it is to see your child take a 30-day chip and a 60-day, you know, and not to have that fear all the time about that kid dying. And, um, and I am so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous, but I really want to talk to the parents out there who don't have sober kids. 
you know, because I don't mean to speed stand before you and say whatever. Um, that God picks who gets sober and who doesn't. That if you do this and this and this, that you stand a better chance of it. You know, what happened is my son accepted, you know, they, they say, but for the grace of God. I say, but for the acceptance of God's grace. Because I think God's grace is there for everybody that walks the face of the planet. But they have to accept that grace. My son had to accept that grace. What I'm so grateful to Alan on is that when that happened, and even if it never had happened, that you taught me how to love that kid unconditionally. And we were a family. And the love that's in this program helped us to continue to be a family. And not this thing that got overrun by the disease of alcoholism, so I was hating my own children because of the pain. I'm so grateful. How can I ever repay it? blows my mind that I had to come to a room full of strangers to learn how to love my own family. But that's exactly what happened to me, and I cannot repay you enough for that. I cannot. I have a little candle and a little wooden candle in my kitchen, and it says, a candle loses nothing of its light by lighting another candle. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for lighting my candle. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.